much. A border sheriff told Congress since the president took office, the number of illegal migrants crossing the southern border has hit historic levels. In response to the crisis, one Republican has now filed impeachment charges against Homeland Security Alejandro Mayorkas. Capitol Hill correspondent Matt Gelka brings us the latest on the Republican investigation into the president's border policies. Republicans had promised to investigate the Biden administration's handling of multiple issues when they gained control of the House chamber. First up, and maybe the most pressing matter, the southern border. During the first in a series of border hearings, the Judiciary Committee heard from multiple people impacted by the unprecedented numbers of people crossing the U.S.-Mexico border. Texan Brandon Dunn emotionally told members about his son Noah's death from fentanyl. He started the Forever 15 project to raise awareness about the drug's dangers. Noah was the third victim in less than two months in Hayes County from illicit fentanyl. Arizona Sheriff Mark Daniels testified how little federal support came to help his border county. The majority of people we uh, talk to, the migrants that have been smuggled, which I call modern day slavery, what they're doing to these people, uh, they tell us the reason they're here is because President Biden and uh, the welcoming sign. As the number of migrant encounters reach historic levels, the panel could move to build a case for impeaching Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas. The Secretary of Homeland Security said the border is closed, the border is secure in March of 2021. Was that true then? No. Is it true now? No. The Biden administration recently began new policies to address the record number of migrant crossings including a legal pathway for Venezuelan, Nicaraguan, Haitian, and Cuban immigrants to enter the country. To some Democrats, the hearings amount to a show trial. The first hearing will showcase the racist tendencies of the extreme MAGA Republican wing of the party that seeks to close the border to refugees from places like Cuba and Venezuela. It almost makes me miss their usual obsession with conspiracy theories and the FBI. Preliminary data shows that illegal crossings were down 40 percent in January. Meanwhile, Representative Annie Biggs from Arizona has formally introduced articles of impeachment for Mayorkas. It would be very rare. The only cabinet official to ever get impeached happened way back in 1876. Matt Gelka, CBN News. Well, we're into new territory in politics when you start seeing cabinet officers being impeached by the U.S. Congress. But here's the reality on the ground. Yes, indeed, President Biden put a, a you know welcome sign up on our so southern border and absolutely has policies that they will not prosecute uh, for illegal immigration. And you actually get released into the United States. You don't get deported immediately. Uh, pending, quote, your tr trial, close quote. So you look at these policies and say, absolutely, this has made a difference. And here's the real proof of it. When you talk to the immigrants, that's exactly what they say. We heard it was open, and so we came. That's why there's this incredible flood. You have to change it. You have to enforce your borders. Otherwise, you don't have a sovereign nation anymore. There's a reason we have immigration laws, and if you're not going to enforce them, then what in the world are you doing in office? Well, in other news, the Fed has raised interest rates for the eighth time in a row. Efren Graham has that story and more from the CBN Newsroom. Efren? Gordon, the rise in consumer prices continues to slow down. In late December, prices were 6.5% higher over the previous year. That's much lower than the summer high of 9%. Still, Americans are paying about 10 percent more for food than last year. Yesterday, the Federal Reserve hiked interest rates just one quarter of a point to keep the slowdown going. The increase means a rise in credit card rates that amounts to about $123 a month for the average family. On the topic of debt, President Biden and House Speaker Kevin McCarthy are wrangling over how to pay the nation's bills. In their first Oval Office meeting Wednesday, the two spent about an hour discussing the $31 trillion debt ceiling. The government hit the ceiling about two weeks ago and can't borrow more money until Congress votes to raise it. McCarthy wants a promise to cut spending first. The president says there should not be any haggling when it comes to meeting the government's obligations.
I will not let anyone use the full faith and credit of the United States as a bargaining chip. The United States of America, we pay our debts. I've been very clear. The current path we're on, we cannot sustain. We've got to change the directory to put ourselves on a path to balance. How we get there will be our discussions. The speaker said he had a good meeting with the president, and he's confident they can find common ground. Yet another search in the saga surrounding President Biden and stored classified documents. The FBI spent three and a half hours going through his home in Rehoboth Beach, Delaware. The White House called the search planned and consensual. The Bureau has already searched his Wilmington home and an old office in Washington. Agents didn't find new documents, but they did remove some handwritten notes from Biden's time as vice president. Lawmakers from both sides of the aisle came together for the 71st National Prayer Breakfast this morning. The Brooklyn Tabernacle Singers made a special appearance. The annual multi-faith gathering gives political and religious leaders the chance to meet, pray together, and build relationships. In keeping with tradition, President Biden headlined the event in his remarks, making reference to wisdom from Democratic Senator Chris Coons of Delaware. I thought it was really incredible what you said, Chris. You said, let's continue the practice of the ministry of presence. The ministry of presence. Being present not just for yourself, but for one another. That's what's expected of those of us in public service. The ministry of presence. It means being there for one another. For the official event, Liberty Council co-sponsored a national gathering of prayer and repentance at the Museum of the Bible that happened yesterday. The breakfast comes after thousands of world leaders, activists, and lawmakers gathered in Washington this week. Their goal is to shine a spotlight on people who are persecuted for their faith and to convince governments to do more to protect them. Caitlin Burke reports from the Religious Freedom Summit. The International Religious Freedom Summit was created to highlight and advance the issue of religious freedom for everyone, everywhere, all the time. With an uptick of global unrest over the last year, organizers believe that along with being a fundamental human right, religious freedom is also a significant foreign policy issue. The United States must continue to be a voice for the voiceless who are persecuted for their beliefs. In our very diverse world, Unless the right to freedom of religion exists for everyone, it doesn't truly exist for anyone. Despite differing political views, honorary congressional co-chairs Mike McCall and Jim McGovern expressed mutual concern about increasing religious persecution worldwide. Countries where religious freedoms are under attack are often countries where repression and instability are the norm. Protecting religious freedom isn't just about doing what's right. It's also a matter of national security. By resolving conflict, we can help prevent terrorism at home and abroad. As religious freedoms advance, conflict recedes. Former ambassador at large for international religious freedom, Sam Brownback, says this issue plays a significant role in current global events. Take Ukraine right now. Ukrainians splitting off a Ukrainian Orthodox Church from the Russian Orthodox Church was one of the things that caused Putin to move. He didn't want Ukraine to break out of the Russian world. It's Russia's ally, China, however, that Brownback believes poses the greatest international threat to religious freedom. It's an authoritarian regime that's seeking to expand their model to, and to export their technology to do it. Dr. Yang Zhan Li, a Chinese dissident and human rights activist, blames the Communist Party. Ultimately, the reason that China has no tolerance for faith is because the CCP wishes to replace human need to worship with a substitute religion centered around the party. Dr. Jean Lee says the evidence is clear. The world just needs to look at what's happened to the Uyghurs, Tibetans, and other faiths to see Beijing systematically eradicating anyone not completely in line with a party-centered allegiance. He's calling on governments to condemn this behavior in the same way they've united against Putin. Brownback says he hopes this summit will help push religious freedom to the next level, making it a top priority at every level of government. Caitlin Burke, CBN News, Washington. And we continue to pray for the persecuted. Gordon? 
Well, let's continue not just to pray, but also be active to say to countries that are repressing religious minorities within their own borders to say, no, in the international stage, we don't allow this. Under the UN um, declarations of human rights, freedom of conscience, freedom of religion, freedom of belief are all central to the principles of the UN. Uh, and we need to honor that and have an enforcement mechanism for these countries to say, if you don't honor it, well, then you have no place on the Security Council. Uh, you, you need to be demoted. You need to lose your status. We're seeing that again and again. And whether it's in the Middle East and Muslim countries and in India, where they're passing anti-conversion legislation, in China, where the repression is obvious and the monitoring of their own population is obvious, North Korea, uh, all of these places, we need to say, no, there is a much better way to go. And that is to allow people to believe in, in accordance with the dictates of their conscience. We need to stand for that. And that includes the belief that you won't believe. That needs to be part of it, too. So um, can we say our ideals really matter? And can we say they really matter on the international stage? Well, Dante Bo endured abuse, homelessness, and loss before his rise to become a Grammy-winning artist. In recent months, the singer also endured a social media scandal that led to his separation from Maverick City Music. Dante took a break from music, touring, and social media, and now he's released his first single from his new album in Times Square. He sat down with Ephraim Graham to take a look back and a look ahead. Under your shadow, under your wing, hide me, hide me, hide me. You could say Dante Bo is coming out of hiding, breaking his silence and returning to the music scene nearly two years after Circles, the breakout album that helped earn him an historic five Grammy nominations in multiple music genres. At night if you're crying, feeling like you're going through hell, that's just circles, circles, around and round we go. Can we talk about that journey the last few months? Um, was there a breaking point? What happened? You know, it's just sometimes God uses people and things to, you know, get us to, you know, our next level or just helps us along the journey. You know, it pushes us out of our comfort zone, out of the nest. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So I think this journey has just been a nest shaking, you know, journey. Mm -hmm. And I've seen God move in miraculous ways in this season like I've never seen him move before. It's mm -hmm. been incredible. The nest shaking for the small town North Carolina boy included a social media firestorm after he posted a short video of himself dancing with friends on a party bus and a Spanish rap song with explicit lyrics playing in the background. So I remember when and then came the unexpected and unceremonious split from Maverick City Music, the wildly popular worship music collective he helped to create. Leaders announced a pause in the relationship because of behavior, quote, inconsistent with core values and beliefs. Dante posted an apology, took a break from social media, and quietly canceled his first solo tour. I think we all woke up surprised um, when Maverick City announces they're pausing their relationship with you. What were you thinking when that was announced? <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> no, honestly, you know, that journey, I feel like that whole season was a little bit of a blur, but I think God's going to use people and things to catapult you into your next step. And so I don't think it was like something that shouldn't have happened. Mm. I think it should have happened because now I have this incredible team. I've rebuilt, you know, my infrastructure with the most incredible people and the most incredible producer, John John, who's helped me release, you know, hide me and this entire album press play. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't think that would have happened if you know, just certain things didn't occur. The trials are not in vain. Nothing is wasted. Nothing's in vain. Pause, press play. The first single from that is Hide Me. Hide Me. Released in Times Square. Yes, can you believe that? <laughs> How dare you? <laughs> can you believe that? The audacity. <laughs> Under your wings. 
me and my producer, John John Webb, who I call my angel, mm -hmm. because in that dark season, John John was knocking on my door because I wasn't answering any phone calls, right? And he was knocking on my door and he came in and we just talked and he's like, let's go up to the studio. And so we immediately started recording, didn't know an album would come out of it, wow. but that's the plan of God, you know? It was just natural. John John started playing that beat. And the first thing I thought of was, you know, I'm under the shadow of the Almighty, you know what I mean? I'm under his wing and there is safety there. And I think this entire season has been me under the shadow of the Almighty. I felt so hidden, so protected and um, close to him. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people would think I felt, you know, a little you know, down or out or, you know, depressed even maybe. But I really felt very protected by the Lord in this season of my life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Looking on the brighter side. I can't believe you're still alive. You have me. I think it's going to be all right. My enemies won't survive. This new season brings a new music venture. His new album will be the first from his new record label, True Music. And he's the CEO. What's your vision for the label? I've been doing it my whole life. You know what I mean? My best friends who I, you know, brought to Maverick, Aaron Moses, Joel Barnes, you know what I mean? So many friends that I brought to Maverick. And it was because I was always just that big brother in music oh, and yeah. teaching how to write, how to, you know, even minister, how to, you know, perform, whatever the case may be. I've always been that for my friends. And so now I guess it's just a little bit more official. <laughs> <laughs> just want to reach back and help other artists become you know, the artists that they think they are, you know what I mean? Also help them do it in a healthy way mm -hmm. and not, you know, them lose themselves. Joy comes in the morning. Weeping can only last one night. We didn't get this far for nothing. There's more joy in this chapter of Dante's journey, and he's ready to pass his life lessons on to others. How does it feel to be standing? I know you've got a team to be standing alone. So you look to your right now, you look to your left, there's no Maverick City, there's no Bethel music, it's Dante. Yeah, you know, it feels really, really good. I love Maverick and I love Bethel music. I mean, they've done so much for me and we're still friends to this day. But um, my new team has just come along and, and made me see my way, myself in ways I never thought I'd see myself, you know? Just, um, just keep, to keep me in prayer and keep me elevated. Different things are necessary for the next journey. And so I think they're, they are super necessary for where I'm going. And I don't even know where I'm going yet, <laughs> but I know it's exciting and it's full of joy and it's, and, and it's God's plan. Ephraim Graham, CBN News, Dallas, Texas. Well, I wish him well on his journey, and we're all on that journey. We're all on that journey to find ourself in him. The single Hide Me from Dante Bo's upcoming album is already out, and you can find it on digital media platforms everywhere. Wentworth Cheswell has a resume unlike any other American in history. He served as a dispatch writer, just like Paul Revere. He fought in one of the most important battles in the Revolutionary War. He was also a teacher a judge, an archaeologist, and a lifelong public servant. In spite of all of his accomplishments, he's been largely forgotten until now. Racism's a dirty word. I don't like to bring it up often, but I I've seen no other reason why some of the citizens in town would have put these roadblocks up for me and these hurdles to jump over if it weren't for that. In the small town of Newmarket, New Hampshire, lies a gravesite of a man whose memory, like his own tombstone, was nearly buried and forgotten. A man of great reputation and even greater accomplishments. Everything about Wentworth Cheswell is, cries exceptionalism. Wentworth Cheswell was born in 1746. His father, Hope Still, was the son of a freed slave. Hope Still was an architect and carpenter who made sure, though his son was of a mixed race, that Wentworth be formally educated. Formal education was rare in 18th century colonial America, much more so for a man of color. There really wasn't much of public schooling back then, and for Wentworth to actually be studying under a Harvard graduate, all of the uh, main subjects, reading, writing, arithmetic, and that was almost unheard of back then um, for even a, you know, a Caucasian person. 
In 1995, New Hampshire graduate student Eric Tuvison wrote his thesis on the remarkable life of Wentworth Cheswell. So it became kind of this intriguing story of who, who was this character? What was it that enabled him to be and to succeed in this society, this environment? After his schooling, Wentworth returned home to Newmarket to become a school teacher and raise a family. He developed such a good reputation that in 1768, he was elected as the town constable, making him the first man of color ever elected to public office in the U.S. During this time, colonial America was engaged in the Revolutionary War. Cheswell was loyal to the Patriot cause and became a dispatch rider like the much better known Paul Revere. He even fought as a private in one of the most significant moments in the Revolutionary War, the Battle of Saratoga. We do know that he served three months under uh, Colonel John Langdon, who was uh, a kind of a famous um, New Hampshire patriot and, and um, military officer. How does a man of great character and reputation nearly vanish from American history? Jerry Ann Bogus has a theory. But that his story disappears from history, disappears from our knowledge, tells us another story as well that tells us that we don't value that story when it comes to a person of color. In 2002, Newmarket local Richard Alperin discovered his home was built on the foundation where Cheswell's home once sat. That discovery encouraged him to dig deeper into history. Ultimately, he found the grave site of Wentworth and his family. Only the site had been poorly kept. It was terrible. I mean, it was completely overgrown. Most of the headstones were broken and several of them, most of them were actually buried. So that's how uh, it started. And uh, naively, I said to myself, I'm gonna fix up the graveyard. Some citizens in Newmarket decided that they would put up barriers to my efforts to fix up the graveyard and, and bring back the memory of Wentworth Cheswell. Um, they tried to get me arrested because I was not aware of a law that said that you can't go into a private family graveyard without written authorization from a proven living descendant. After four years of hard work and with the help of living descendants, Rich raised funds to clean up and restore the gravesite. In 2007, he convinced the State Historical Society to grant the resting place an historical marker. He was forgotten about for too long. Forgotten about for his accomplishments, forgotten about as being a founding father of the town. I just don't feel it's right that, uh, that a town should not even know who was here before us um, because it's due to these people who came before us that we are here today. Wentworth Cheswell served in public office in every year of his adult life but one. Amongst his notable achievements, he was an auditor, an historian, an assessor, an archaeologist, a judge, and a coroner. He was a respected member of the community that was often a representative of one form or another uh, in his town government. He served in a lot of different capacities, so he wasn't necessarily just wanting to be at the top and nothing else was good enough for him. He would serve in whatever role was deemed to be necessary and appropriate. I mean, we're a country that values first and not to acknowledge the accomplishment of a man at that time is always just mind-blowing. How do we not know these stories? Though he was nearly forgotten, folks like Rich Alperin have fought to revive the memory of Wentworth Cheswell and to make sure that the Cheswell name endures. Underdogs need to be helped up. And for what this man did for his entire life, he needs to be remembered and he needs to be helped up. And if I can do it in any way I can, I'm gonna do it any way I can. What picture do you get when you hear the phrase founding fathers? Well, let's change that picture with Wentworth Cheswell and say, well, here is one of our founding fathers. Here is someone who fought in the Revolutionary War, one of the most strategic battles of the war, the uh, Battle of Saratoga. Here's someone that devoted his life to public service, to helping people, helping people in New Hampshire, but helping people throughout the colonies and then in the formation of this wonderful nation, the United States of America, where we have this dream. 
that we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all people are created equal. The original draft, it had all men, but let's say all people are created equal. Now, here's the problem with that. The person who wrote that document was himself a slave owner. So clearly it was aspirational, or clearly he was having blinders as to his own conduct. Let's take those blinders off, and let's make the aspiration real to say yes. These are history moments that should be celebrated. Let's change our view of Founding Father, and in that process, change our view of our generation and the generations to come. This is Black History Month. We want to remember the wonderful history that we all share, and let's celebrate it together. Welcome back to the 700 Club for this CBN News Break. Family, friends, and advocates for justice from all across the nation memorialized Tyree Nichols Wednesday. The 29-year-old died after suffering a brutal beating at the hands of members of a special unit of the Pol Memphis Police Department. Vice President Kamala Harris was in attendance, as well as the families of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and others who died at the hands of police. Nichols' family remembered him as a loving father. I see the world showing him love and fighting for his justice. But all I want is my baby brother back. Memphis has fired five officers and others, and they face second-degree murder charges. The vice president called on Congress to pass federal police reform. Prayer matters. That is the view of the majority of American voters. That is according to a poll by Summit.org and McLaughlin and Associates. 67% believe public calls for prayer after a national tragedy are effective. About 20% said prayer is ineffective. 13% are not sure. The poll was taken in the days after Buffalo Bills safety DeMar Hamlin suffered cardiac arrest and collapsed on the field, resulting in nationwide we see an outpouring of prayer many crediting those prayers with DeMar's miraculous survival and turnaround. I want to remind you, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website. It's CBNNews.com. Alan's parents saved for a month to get their son's eye checked. That's when they got hit with a double dose of bad news. The doctor said Alan had a traumatic cataract and desperately needed surgery. And then he said the operation was going to cost far more than they could ever afford. 12-year-old Alan was playing with his friends when he accidentally ran into a branch that struck his right eye. It poked my eye and it hurt so badly. I checked my eye in the mirror, but I couldn't see anything. I didn't tell my parents because they might get mad at me. But Alan's mom, Susan, noticed right away that his eye was bloodshot. He wouldn't tell me what happened. His playmate said that he had sore eyes, so I put some herbal medicine on his eye. Then Alan's eyesight started to get worse. We were reading his schoolwork together, but he couldn't read. He started to cry. He said, Mom, I can't see anything. Then he finally told me what happened. I was scared because I might go blind. I couldn't read, make a kite, or play outside. One time, I even stepped on a broken piece of glass because I couldn't see well. I felt so sorry for him. Kids started calling him One Eye. Alan's father earns $8 a day as a laborer. It took him a month to save enough money to finally get the eye checked. That's when a doctor diagnosed him with a traumatic cataract. The specialist said he urgently needed surgery and that it would cost $1,700. I felt weak when he said that. I thought, is there any hope for my son to get this surgery now? One day, while Operation Blessing was delivering food to the community, we met Alan and arranged for him to receive free surgery to repair the traumatic cataract in his eye. When I opened my eyes after the surgery, I could see clearly. Instead of fear, I now feel joy. God used Operation Blessing to bless us. We are so grateful to you. Because of you, our lives that were once dark are now bright. 
Whenever I see these stories, I wonder how I as a parent would react if this was my son. And, you know, to think that there was something that could be done, but you just can't ever and won't ever be able to afford it. And this little boy would have lost the ability to see how his life would have changed. His life did change, but it changed not because of that eye injury. It changed because of your generosity and compassion, 700 Club members. We just say thank you to you. Listen, joining the 700 Club makes this kind of miracle. It's a miracle for people who cannot do this on their own possible. You give not just hope, you give a future, you give life. And so we say thank you to you. To those of you who haven't yet joined, listen, it's 65 cents a day, $20 a month. Such an unbelievable opportunity to change lives, to change the world, to show the love of Jesus, and we can all do it. Will you join if you haven't joined before? There's our toll-free number on your screen. It's 1-800-700-7000. You can just call and tell the friend on the other end, I'd like to join the 700 Club. That would be a, a call they would rejoice over today. Maybe you are a 700 Club member, and you've called and done that, and you've been generous for years, and you've just never changed it. You know, you can you can increase your giving and it makes a huge difference. Take a look at this chart we have. The first level is the 700 Club with the general membership. The second one is 700 Club Gold. Some of you might be able to go up to that at a gift of $40 a month or join the 1000 Club, $84 a month. Then we have a 2500 Club level at $209 a month or you could become a founder. They give a gift of $5,000 or more a year and that works out to $417 a month. Do something today to make a difference in the lives of people you may never know, may never have an opportunity to reach until heaven. And then they're going to be in a long line to say thank you to you. And when you call today, I want you to know we have a gift for you. This is Gordon's latest teaching, Divine Direction, God's Blueprint for Your Future. I love this teaching, and I think it's going to be a blessing to you, too. It comes along with a 21-day devotional that is Wonderful. You know, this time right before Lent, many of us are doing uh, additional devotions, some people fasting during this time. This would be a great opportunity for you to do that as well with these materials. It's our way of saying thank you for caring about others. You can call us, you can email us, and you can text us. But we'll love to give all of this to you when you join the 700 Club. Do it today. 1-800-700-7000. A tracheostomy, a feeding tube, and dialysis. Doctors said advanced life support was Rusty's only hope of survival. His wife, Annette, was forced to make an excruciating decision. Yet during this darkest of times, she continued to cling to the promises of God and to the power of prayer. He got on the phone. He was very weak. It was horrible because I didn't know if that would be the last time I'd ever speak to him. In late July 2021, a carefree summer came to an abrupt halt when Annette and Rusty Beggarly contracted COVID-19. Annette recovered quickly. Rusty did not. By August 5th, he was in ICU at Lynchburg General Hospital. They called me and they said he was going to be put on a ventilator and he would be in ICU. And it was terrifying because I had heard so many stories of people who went into ICU and never came back. Annette asked to speak to her husband on the phone. I told him I loved him. I kept telling him I loved him. I didn't want to do this life without him. Over the next week, Rusty continued to worsen. Annette's church rallied around her in 24-7 prayer. I knew they had our back, that they were praying, that they were standing in for me. Annette believed that God would heal her husband, yet she faced the stark reality that he might not. I had to surrender everything to God, and if you choose for him to live, we'll praise you forever for it. But if you choose not to bring him back, we will yet serve you. By the end of two weeks, Rusty had declined even further as he developed severe acute respiratory syndrome known as SARS. I would pray, meditate, you know, praise God. And I got his wedding band and I anointed it with oil. I would read and when I would get to a point where God was giving me a promise, I would set that wedding band in that spot on my Bible. There was one positive development during that time. 
On August 16th, Rusty was declared COVID free. It also happened to be the couple's 35th wedding anniversary, and Annette could be there with her beloved husband. Their reunion, however, was bittersweet. So I went through the door. He was very swollen. He's totally sedated. I stood by his side and, and holding his hand. <laughs> I was just so filled with compassion for him. Every day in the coming weeks, Annette would drive two hours to visit Rusty. Holding on to hope was getting harder. He would look a little more agitated, a little more swollen. I talked to him, even though he didn't look like he could understand me, but it was horrifying because I didn't know if he had brain damage. Then Rusty's organs began shutting down. The Beggarly's son, Russell, is the nursing director of a COVID unit at a nearby hospital. He knew his dad was dying. It, it was incredibly grim, and I'd seen a lot of cases similar to this that had bad outcomes, that they did not survive. So I did not have a lot of hope that he was going to recover. Doctors now said it was time to make a decision whether or not to put Rusty on advanced life support, which meant a tracheostomy, a feeding tube, and dialysis. It was the most excruciating decision I have ever made in my life. They said he might die, he might live, but he had a 50% chance to live and I had to give him that chance to live. After several days, Rusty still showed no signs of recovery. Annette pressed on, held up by the prayers of her family and their church. It was not a good prospect that he was gonna live. When everything looked completely dark and bleak, I held on to those promises God gave me. And I would say repeatedly, God, I trust you with this. Then on September 19th, 2021, Annette, as usual, came to see her husband. This time... Up in the bed, fully cognizant, totally aware, smiling at me, talking to me, and I'm like, Jesus, he has been resurrected. I was elated. It was so wonderful to finally get to see her, just to look on her face. I mean, it just, it, it was, it was wonderful. It was amazing for me to see that. And mentally, you know, he's there again, he's talking to us. It was, it was a miracle. Rusty was overwhelmed with gratitude to God and for the people who prayed him back to life. It makes me realize how much God does love me. All the prayers, all the cards, all the texts, just I cried. And that special woman he calls his wife. I never realized what, you know, she was willing to go through. Uh, for me, it just awes me, you know, her, for how much faith she had. After four more weeks at the long-term acute care facility, Rusty went home. Five months later, Rusty was back at work with no physical disabilities. He stays busy making up for lost time with Annette and his family. I will never cease to thank God for that day and the fact that he gave me my husband back. That's one of those things that's it's been amazing to me to see that he does still do miracles. So I'm blessed every day that I get up. Every day I'm still breathing, I'm still walking. It really makes me feel good. I mean, just people see me knowing how close I was to dying and that he, he brought me right back. Grasp onto those promises you get out of the Word of God and never let them go. For one thing, I'm living proof that God will heal people. Pray. There is exponential power in prayer, so much power in prayer. Don't give up. Back from the brink, you know, you've heard us say it before, but prayer makes a difference. And you heard Rusty's wife talk about grabbing hold of the power of prayer, you know, speaking those things, declaring those things, believing those things makes a difference. We want to pray with you today. We know many of you have serious needs in your lives. Maybe it's not physical for some of you. You know, it could be relationship needs, could be financial needs. We want to stand with you at your point of need and declare the promises of God as we pray together today. We've got some other prayer 
uh, messages here that have come in from people who've had God do something miraculous for them. This is Lucy. She lives in Mercedes, Texas. She had major problems with her digestive tract. She was watching this program just last November, and Gordon, she heard you mm -hmm. say, there's someone, your name is Lucy. You've just heard that story about intestinal problems, and you have the same thing. You eat, and it just causes enormous pain. God is healing your intestines right now. He's healing everything in the small intestine, all that lining, all of that problem. In Jesus' name, be healed and be made whole. Lucy knew the word of knowledge was for her, and she began thanking God for her healing. In January of 2023, Lucy called to say she's still giving God all the glory for a complete healing. He knows you by name. He numbers every hair on your head. He's vitally concerned about you. And here's one from Cynthia. Hello, on your prayer segment several weeks ago, Terry prayed for someone having swallowing issues. Mm -hmm. I claim this prayer and my swallowing issue has been healed. I waited a few weeks to make sure I wasn't dreaming. I love that. <laughs> now when I swallow and I think I'm just going to have an issue, the food just slides on through. I'm so blessed by God and by the 700 Club. Thank you, Terry, for this prayer and thank mm -hmm. you, God, for hearing my claim for healing. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You can have a life of thank yous. You can thank God for all his many blessings. Let us bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who crowns you with tender mercies, loving kindness. You can find that wonderful passage in Psalm 103. It's in your Bible, too. One of the things from that story I really want to underline, don't get out of the Word of God. How do you get faith? Well, faith comes by hearing. How do you get hearing? Hearing comes by the Word. How do you stay in the Word? Well, you read it. You live it. You quote it. You say it to other people. You say it over your circumstance. You say it over yourself. You say it over your family. You say it over your neighborhood, your city, your state, your country. You say it over the entire world. It's through the announcing of the good news. The gospel is the power of God. When you understand that link, that I believed in my heart, therefore I spoke. You just saw a miracle happen. A miracle because somebody believed in their heart. They stayed in the word of God and by faith they announced and they announced it. They said it out loud. Now, we're going to do that right now. You're going to do it over yourself. We're going to join with you. We're going to speak to that mountain, whatever it is, whatever pain, whatever infirmity, whatever disease. We're going to speak to it out loud. The first thing you need to have is the firm belief that he forgives all your iniquities and he heals all your disease. I believed in my heart, therefore I spoke. Jesus says, when you speak to the mountain and do not doubt in your heart, you'll have what you ask. So believe it, believe that you have already received this wonderful promise. So here's the question for you. When were your sins forgiven? It's a good question, right? When, when did that happen? It happened 2,000 years ago on a cross. God's already done it. It's already been accomplished. Jesus already said it's finished. I've won this battle. I've got it. So the same cross healed your diseases. By his stripes, we were healed. That's what the Bible says. Now all we have to do is receive it. Let's do it right now. Lord God Almighty, we come to you. We come to the throne of grace believing, and we take the authority that you've given us. You give us authority to heal disease. You give us authority to cast out devils. You give us authority. So we take the authority you have given. We announce that authority over our own bodies, and we say to them right now, be healed and be made whole. By the stripes of Jesus Christ, I am healed. I receive it now. There is no more disease. There's no more pain. There's no more infirmity. I receive all that Jesus paid for me now in his name. 
What you couldn't do before, do it now. Begin to move your knee. Begin to move your ankle. If you couldn't walk before, begin to walk. If you couldn't use that elbow, you couldn't use that shoulder, use it right now and receive it in Jesus' name. Terry, God's given you something. Yeah, there's a man named Theo, and um, Theo, you know Jesus and you love him, but you really question this part of the show. It just really doesn't resonate with you. It's not been part of your your religious experience or your, your theological history. God's healing you right now, Theo. Put your hands up, thank him, and receive it. And somebody else, the same thing. You have a knee issue. You've had it for a long time. Just begin to thank God. Receive it. It's done in Jesus' name. Uh, someone you're suffering with nerve damage. I don't know how this is, but you know what I'm, I'm describing. It's nerve damage above both temples um, and in your forehead. God is healing you right now. That pain is leaving you, all that swelling, all that problem. And, and he's going to give you all of your expressions, all of your facial expressions are returning to you right now in Jesus' name. There's someone else just suffering with Bell's palsy, mm. and God is healing your nerves. He's healing all of that, reducing all that swelling, giving you back control over your face. In Jesus' name, receive it now. And at least one of the people that are being healed of Bell's palsy, you've had it a long time, and you think that's never coming back, but today's your day. Just begin to feel it as it rejuvenates. Amen and amen. If you've been healed, let us know. Let us share in your good report. Give us a call, 1-800-700-7000. Here's a word from Corinthians. God will do this, for he is faithful to do what he says, and he has invited you into partnership with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. God bless you.